Russian army is committing barbaric actions. Today we'll be talking about two separate aspects uh, on the implications and ramifications on understanding the war in Ukraine. One of them is going to be about a specific case, the Danish opt-out from defense policy in the European Union. And the other one is going to be about the enlargement of the European Union. And uh, who not better to do this than our executive uh, director, uh, he's Italian, but really wannabe Danish because he's written his PhD up there, speaks the language uh, fluently and understands the soul of the Danes and also enlargement. So warmly welcome Fabrizio Tassinar. <laughs> so um, as we are recording this today, it's a big day in Danish history. They have an opt-out on defense policy. They actually have an opt-out also on the euro and from Schengen, but there's a referendum in Denmark. What's your prediction? And obviously, we'll see if you get it right or wrong. Well, my prediction and my hope is that the, the, the opt-out is going to uh, go away after today. And that's going to be a big momentous step for the country and I suppose for Europe as a whole. Well, you talk a lot with your colleagues in Denmark. You follow the Danish media. You've been commenting this uh, in the Italian media and everywhere. Um, I mean, why, why did this change happen? Is, is this only because of the war in Ukraine or would it have happened otherwise? Now, this is exactly the, uh, the, the, the same kind of development that we have witnessed uh, in some of the other Nordic countries. It would have never happened without the war in Ukraine. In fact, uh, the, the, the Italian television this morning wanted to call the segment the Putin's, Putin's masterpiece that he managed uh, for this to, to happen. Uh, in a way, Denmark was always on, 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 on the borderline between overt Euroscepticism and just going with the flow whenever possible. It never really went as far as a Danish Brexit, so to speak, even though some fear that that could have happened after 2016. But this opt-out system was never really challenged for 30 years. And then 24th of February happens and again something dramatic and, uh, and uh, really unprecedented takes place. And remind us, where did the opt-out come? Where did the opt-outs come from? If I recall correctly, it was because the Danes voted against the Maastricht treaty in a referendum and then there was a set of sort of opt-outs that were done and I assume this was part of it. It's correct. This is, this is after 1993 and of course the, the least common denominator of all these opt-outs is that it's in the areas where sovereignty is most pronounced. Whether that is the case or not, you know, it varies. In the defense case you could argue it's more symbolic. Uh, than, 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 than anything else. But nevertheless, the tone of the debate in the country about the referendum and of course about the opt-out mm -hmm. for the whole time has been about whether Denmark would uh, agree to a European army. And that was really never uh, the, the, the issue. We know that um, European defense policy has in fact been one of those areas where integration has been more difficult and more complex. Uh, but certainly European army was never uh, an objective, a realistic one. And um, I suppose now the, the issue will not be on the table anymore. How about Denmark in general? I mean, obviously both of us have watched Borgen, right? Mm. So I, I really like it. I especially like this sort of fourth season or this mm. new season because it brings in you know, Danish security policy in, mm. in, in a different kind of way. So is it too much to say that you know, Danish security is a bilateral relationship with the United States and the strategic nexus of it all is Greenland. And therefore, European defense is a bit secondary. Am I simplifying too much? Well, look, uh, uh, you, I, I'm biased because, of course, I'm an outsider who has lived in the country and has come mm. to love the country. But in any way, this, this, this Atlantic bond has been extremely yeah. strong throughout at least the, the 15, 20 years that I have mm. had the opportunity to, uh, to follow. And, you know, whether the connection to Greenland is direct or indirect, um, it, 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 is, it, it has all, always been a very strong value-based mm. uh, partnership. Uh, um, and I suppose you could put it that way that Denmark has always liked to see itself as a sort of 
special relationship, but in a smaller scale. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Europe has suffered from a parallel, uh, 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 let's say, predicament, which is that of a relatively, uh, um, um, let's say, protective country, not protectionist, but protective of its values and of, and of what the country stands for. And in a way, uh, Europe was not something to fight necessarily, but something that would dilute that, that special thing. Before I move to enlargement, let's do an exit question. Because, of course, a lot of people thought that Brexit, in other words, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, was the first exit from the European Union. But it's not really like that, is it? Greenland left first, didn't they? That's right, that's right. Greenland was, was, was the first. And I think it's also fair to say that there is not going to be a domino ef effect after that. So uh, in, a, in a sense, you can say that in a minor scale, what is happening in Denmark, hopefully today, is that you're going to see a realignment among uh, the Nordic countries in terms of their security policy. And that is, again, something that was impossible to foresee until three months ago. Yeah, I'm fully with you because, I mean, you know, I'm a sort of a, a funny Finn. In other words, I'm bilingual or a Finn Swede. So my mother tongue or actually father tongue is, is Swedish. So I always felt a very strong bond with the Nordics. But at the same time, for me, it was never the big political arena. Yeah, in the EU, it was nice to talk to our European colleagues. It was great to have, you know, foreign minister meetings with Carl Bildt and Jonas Garstöre and, and the rest of it, Lene Espresso. But the truth is that it wasn't a big thing, but I've actually never felt more Nordic than right now because mm. of the support that we got for NATO membership. And I think bringing in now Denmark mm. to the defense side, I think there could be a bit of a new Nordic coalition mm. inside the EU and, and inside NATO as well. Indeed. But another thing that you've been working on a lot over the years is, is enlargement. So, so run us through a little bit. I mean, how do you see... Um, the war in Ukraine affecting enlargement mm. on a big scale. So not let's look scale. at the macro stuff yeah. first. So I think, you know, the starting point is that in many ways the uh, EU enlargement has been the most successful foreign policy of the EU for a number of years. But that success was premised on a, on a paradox. And the paradox mm. is that the EU cannot expand forever. Mm. So it's successful to the extent that then you bring countries in, but then at some point you have to stop. And, you know, before Ukraine, we had, in fact, reached that stage where the sort of, in jargon, you call it the absorption capacity, the extent to which the EU can expand was reaching its, its limits. And then, you know, again, something happens uh, that it's not endogenous. It doesn't come from the inside. It comes from the outside. And the tables have turned. Yeah, you know, I'm a very scary individual because in the European Parliament, I wrote a report I think it was either in AFCOS, the Constitutional Committee, or in AFET, on the absorption capacity mm. of the European Union. And that was, for some, a code word for you know, keeping, keeping enlargement out. out. Now, of course, we could be, or we are, in a situation where you have Russia, which is isolated, and on the other side, you have more or less 40 mm. European countries. Mm. So the 27 EU countries, then you have what I call the three plus five plus one group of countries that kind of want to join mm. the European Union but are not there yet. Um, three are quite far away, let's be honest about it. Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. Mm. Turkey is the one and they're a little bit alone. And then five Balkan countries, Western Balkan countries that are knocking at the door. And then under that, you kind of have five countries that don't want to join but have some kind of relationship. So the United Kingdom, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, mm. and, and Switzerland. So where do you see the priorities coming? Because we're now moving towards a European Council meeting, EU mm. summit. Mm. The big guys and girls get together uh, at the end of June. Uh, what, what, what should they decide? Yeah. I think, you know, the, 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 the decision will have to be made between in and out. For, for the longest time, uh, the EU and, and its leaders play around the, the thought that you could have a limbo of some sort, where you were not in, you were not out, you would have some of the qualities of a membership, but not all of them. And again, you know, all the frameworks that have been devised to, to, to somehow put, put 
flash into this have not really worked. Mm. Uh, the European neighborhood policy, the Eastern partnership, yes, you could have a trade agreement, you could have some visa liberalization, mm. but in the end, for these countries especially, the price is the in or out question. And again, we are at that point where we cannot really elude that question any longer without disappointing uh, profoundly. I'm not prejudging that we will actually reach a positive result on this, but if we don't, we will be disappointing some, some countries. The bottom line, in my opinion, is how you define the stages and how you define the steps that leads to the membership. What I think the EU is not in a position of doing is to create in practice different permanent levels of membership. That yeah. they cannot do. You know, I was in Davos at the World Economic Forum the other week and I had two very striking off-the-record Chatham House conversations. One was with only 20 people in the room. One was with leaders from the Gulf region and the Middle East mm. and one was with leaders from the Western Balkans. Now, in the good spirit of Chatham House, I'm not going to say who said what, but there was this sentiment that in the Gulf region and Middle East, it was all about peace and prosperity and economic development and forget geopolitics, we can do this together. And then with the Western Balkans, it was very much that, listen, if enlargement doesn't happen this time around, this is going to lead to big trouble. Mm. And of course, if we look at the countries there, I mean, we have two that are in already, so Slovenia and, and Croatia. Mm. Then, as far as I remember, and this is off the top of my head, uh, two are uh, negotiating, so Serbia and Montenegro. Mm. And then there are two that want to start the accession process, and those would be North Macedonia mm. uh, and Albania. And then there are kind of two that are in a difficult position, mm. Bosnia-Herzegovina mm. with its own internal mm. trouble, and then, of course, Kosovo as well, which hasn't been recognized mm. by, by Serbia. So, so it becomes a geopolitical issue. But mm. where do you see this going now? The, the key question for European policymakers is how they define conditionality and how strict they define conditionality. Because we all know that uh, they got, quote unquote, burnt with some of the countries that they accepted in the EU by... Uh, uh, you know, not being able to, you know, impose things. Absorb. 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 Uh, so the question is, if this remains an inherently technical exercise, then you would be very strict about conditions with the probable result that, again, these countries would be in line for a very long time without any prospect. And the problem with that is that if there is no momentum, if there is no movement, the countries, the governments, they lose incentives. They, they say, why, why are we doing this for? What's, what's the point? What do we get out of this? So you need to somehow find a good equilibrium there. And the tipping, the thing that will tip the scale in the end will be to consider enlargement again, no longer a technical exercise, but a political and geopolitical uh, principle decision. So those strong statements have to come from the leaders and then, of course, we have to reverse engineer how we actually get the result that we want. And I think this is a great example of the impact uh, of the war in Ukraine uh, here in Europe. Essentially, it really is about the enlargement of, say, eight plus one countries into the European Union. For many years, uh, we were in a state where enlargement became unpopular. We felt that there are too many countries in there. After the time in 1995 when Finland, Sweden and Austria joined, and then 10 countries in 2004 and uh, 2007. Uh, and now we are again at a stage where probably enlargement will have to move in one direction or another, and as Fabrizio said, it's not a technical exercise, it's a political strategic exercise. And it'll be really interesting to see what the outcome is in the interim at the European summit end of this month. Thanks again for uh, listening and watching our questions and answers on understanding the war. We're all trying to make sense of it. Hope you are too. The Russian army is committing barbaric actions.